All right, you guys ready to jump into James uh, here in the last 15 minutes? I know that we only have a f couple of minutes. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll, of course, I say that. I say things. I'm a lot like the Apostle Paul in, in this way. Uh, and we've seen, we saw it in the book of Philippians. And if you read any of Paul's writings, you'll see the same thing. He says the word finally every now and then. I mean, it'll be like, well, in the book of Philippians, as an example, he says, finally, at the start of the third chapter, which you have all of the third chapter left and all of the fourth chapter, but he's, he's in his finally on, on the third chapter. And so I, I, was in, I was very much encouraged when I saw that because I said, well, all right, I'm in good company. Uh, what does finally mean to a preacher? Not much, uh, but I'm in, I'll, we'll do a little bit of something today with the book of James because I know that you're all just chomping at the bits to just be just be drug over the coals today, right? I mean, I mean you you're just ready, you're just ready to get what James has to say. You know, I uh, since it's only, you know, a small group of us here today uh, just talking about James as a person. Uh, of course, obviously, I mean, I am old, but I, I didn't know James personally, but the, uh, but I do, I have studied him quite a bit, and, and I think after this week, Wesley probably knows James pretty good. Uh, what kind of paper did you, you had to write how many, what type of paper was it? It was, uh, it was 13 pages, 3,000 words on three verses. All right, now imagine this, all right, you're, you're a student, and one of your classes is in theology and Bible and so forth, and, and your assignment is to write 3,000 words, 15 pages. All right, that right there blows everybody to start with, like, oh, my goodness. 15,000 words, three pages, on, um, <laughs> three, I'm on three verses. 15,000 on three verses. 3,000, 3, 15 pages, 3,000 <laughs> on three verses. I'm trying, y'all. Come on. <laughs> work with me. Would you work with me? Are you blown away, too? I'm blown away. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, that's a lot of words on very few ver on three verses. Three verses in the book of James. What verses were they, by the way? Two through four. Verses two through four. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your fa faith works patience, and let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Those, that's it right there. All right. There you go. Can you write the paper <laughs> on those, on that? I'm thinking, my goodness, man, he, has to, he would have to really kind of chase rabbits more than I do to write that many words or that few of thought. But, you know, it's really the reason why uh, that's so significant and, and, and assignments like that are so significant is because the Word of God is just so full, guys. It's so rich. It, it is so, um, you, can, you know, you can read it and you can get something surface level. You can just read those verses and you can say, okay, what those verses are saying is that I need to not get so bummed out when, when stuff starts happening in my life because uh, it's, going to, it's going to increase my patience and patience is going to help me be a better person. I mean, that's the surface level thought of those verses, really. But there's just so much more to that when you begin to delve behind what is this really saying to us and what would have to happen in my life in order for this to be true. And how would that happen? How would, I mean, what, how could I be blessed? How could I be grown up by some of these things that so easily beset all of our lives? Is there anyone in here who hasn't had to suffer in life? You say, there's never been a time when you said, man, I'm just suffering. This is, mm. or you thought to yourself, God, come on, man. Give me some help here. This is ridiculous. Or, Lord, you please, you're going to have to help me get through this. I can't take this anymore. Or had some type of emotional response or feeling like that with the Lord. Well, we would, we would call all of those times trials in our life. And James saying to us, led by the Holy Spirit of God, and of course God being the author of all of this, the Holy Spirit, the Father, is the author of the Word of God. The Bible says this of itself. I know a lot of times when we're talking about different people like the Apostle Paul or James or Peter, 
uh, or any of the prophets, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, any of those, Moses, Abraham, talking about Noah, the book of Genesis, or any of the places you're talking in the Bible and you start talking about a person, it, it, it's almost like you, you accept the fact that some person wrote this to you. Like I've talked about James, and it's easy for me to talk about James because I, I identify so closely with James, and James had a nickname called Old Camel Knees because he spent all the time on his knees before the Lord praying. Well, it's, it, it's easy to like somebody like that. You know, it's easy to believe that somebody who's that close to the Lord and spends so much time before the Lord praying not only for himself and what God would do through him and to him and that he would be everything God wanted him to be, but also praying for, for, the, for the church that he pastored. James was a pastor of a church. He was the pastor of the first Christian church in the city of Jerusalem. And it was a big church. It was the church where a lot of people came very quickly because of the tremendous miracles that were going on in the city of Jerusalem. You know, Peter preached and thousands of people get saved in, on one day. And then they have another meeting the next day and thousands of people get saved on that day. And they, and they all come into the church. They're all babies born in Christ, you know. They're all don't, they don't know anything about, about Christianity and about the Lord and the Holy Spirit and what God's going to do in their life. And, all. and so imagine all of a sudden pastoring a church with 10,000 people. And none of them know anything about Christ other than the fact that he was hung on a cross and died and, and, and that, they, that, that he was God. He claimed to be God's son and that God did miracles and, 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 he, and he appears to be who he said he would be because he resurrected on the third day. And, and it's just been tremendous. And, and, and now I've accepted him as my savior and I'm in a church. No, so tell me what to do. And there's 10,000 or more like that. And imagine you're the pastor with 10,000 like that, and only a half a handful of people that know anything about the Lord. They were the ones that were traveling with Jesus, you know, that misfit, motley bunch of guys that, you know, trying to, Jesus was whipping into shape to be the ministers of the gospel. And that's you. And, and imagine how much praying you would have to do if you were trying to lead a group like that. And imagine what, what your days would be like. What, what, life would be like for you. Imagine when somebody came up to you and said, Pastor, I need to talk to you about this. What are they going to ask you about? What are you going to tell them that they're going to be able to understand? I mean, these were the kind of days that James was in. And, and the gospel had not gone to the Gentiles. The gospel uh, the Apostle Paul had not started doing any ministry yet. There was no uh, missionary journeys to reach people in the, like, like the, the Philippians and the Ephesians and the Colossians and the Galatians and all these. There, were none, there was none of that. There was none of that. There was no even word written down. There was no text. There was no Bible. The Bible hadn't been put together yet. The books, there, there may be a little piece of a of a book of Isaiah over here, or maybe there was a little tiny scrap of Jeremiah over here, or there might have been something that Peter wrote down that he felt the Holy Spirit said to him. And yeah, I mean, there were just scraps and bits and pieces. There was no word of truth. There was no identified Bible that would you could go to and open up and say, well, look here and see what God said, and let's get some, let's learn about this. There was no... So you're a pastor and you're standing in front of 10,000 people that came to the Lord and they want their lives to be different and they want to be, and they want to be different and they want the Holy Spirit to lead their life. They, they, they want to do what Jesus would have them to do, but they have no idea what that is. You really have no idea what that is and you're all there and you're just about a half a step ahead of the hounds. You know, you're the fox and the hounds are after you and you're about a half a step ahead of them and, and you're trying to stay there. And, and, he, and that's James. That's the writer. That's the one who writes in this first chapter all of this stuff about trials. The whole chapter is about trials as a child of God. Do we have them? What are they for? Why does God let them happen? What can they do for us? How can we respond to this? What is this all about? Why would God ever let this happen in our life? And, and, and can we make it through these things? And so 
we pop in, in, you know, 2017, in our society and in our culture and in our day, looking at the Word of God and saying, what is James trying to say to us? Now, because I've been with him for about the past uh, five or six weeks, <laughs> I mean, I know we've, I've preached, what, three messages, four messages out of James so far. And uh, this is just a continuation of, of, of the fourth message. I just didn't get finished with it. And so I've been with him for about six weeks now and seven weeks or more uh, looking at what, what I asked the Lord to show me about James was his heart. Lord, help, show me his heart. Show, show me what it is that he would be saying here so that it will mean something to us other than just some words on a page from a historical person who loved God and, and, and was a half-brother of Jesus. Because what these pages and what these verses share with us are truth from God that God wants to place into our lives so that we can become, according to what these verses say, that we, could be, that we can be perfect. Now, will you understand the word perfect doesn't mean that I'm going to be perfect, a perfect person. It means that I am being perfected is what the, really the context is. That God is in the process of perfecting me. So from now until I go to be with the Lord or until the Lord comes back after me, I'm going to be in a process. God has planted a seed in me. That seed has begun to grow. God has watered that seed. God has fed that seed. And now that seed is beginning to grow. And what now needs to happen is it's come time to produce some fruit. And what is that fruit? Well, the fruit of the seed that God has birthed in us is the image of Christ. It's the, it's the manifestation of Jesus in our life. The purpose of God for all of our lives is very simple. It is that we would reflect the image of Jesus. That's simply it. You say, well, am I to be a missionary? Well, God might call you to be a missionary. Well, am I to be a pastor? Well, God might call me to be a pastor. Am I to be a worship leader? Well, God might call you to be a worship leader. Am I going to be a mom or a dad? Am, am I going to be a, a, a Bible leader? Am I going to lead a small group? Am I going to... I mean, there are lots of questions about the specific aim of the fulfillment of the purpose of God in you. But the simple purpose is that you would become the image of Jesus. That is God's, that's God's plan for your life. And that we would leave places like this, which are like filling stations, station, pet rallies, informational gatherings, instructional institutes, so to speak, and go out and live in the world out there that is dark and dangerous, among whom the Bible says that we shine as lights in this world. God's intention for us is not that we would be great in here. God's intention is that we would be reflective out there and that we would reflect out of our lives out there in the dark world that we live in the image of the glory of Christ that God has put a seed in us and that seed has grown and now that seed is ready to bear fruit and that fruit is the image of Jesus and that I am to take it outside and let it shine, and that's the purpose of God in my life. I mean, I've threatened to put a, a sign over the door, and I, I still, maybe Dion, you could make it for me or somebody. I, maybe I put, to put a sign over the door as we go out the door, uh, you have now entered the game. Play like a champion. Play like a champion. 
Because this is the locker room, man. This is where you come in here and the coach beats on you. And the coach tells you what you did right and what you did wrong and what we're going to do for the next play and how we're going to play the next half and what tomorrow ought to look like and all that kind of stuff. But, but this, is not, this is not life. This is where we prepare for life, and out there is, what, is, where we, is where we perform. That's where the ministry really starts. And, really, and so James, that's what James is all about. It's the heart of a man who says, there are things that you need to know in order to allow the purpose of God to be completed in your life. Because if you don't, if you're not aware of these things, you are going to hinder, you're going to stunt yourself. You're going to, you're not going to accomplish the purpose because you're going to be overwhelmed by issues that happen in your life. Because every man does have issues in life. Look at your neighbor and say, you have some issues. You got some issues. Yeah, you got some issues. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. And, and you're not by yourself because we all, James says, every man is tempted. Every man has trials. Not black men, not white men, not red men, not old men, not young men, not women, not men, not children, but all men have temptation. And all of us, me, you, spiritual people, non spirit we all have issues in life. So the question becomes, how do we handle it? How do we view this? How do we, how do we, look, how do we benefit from this? It's going to happen in life. How do we benefit from this? It's inevitable. You know, something is concern, considered inevitable if it will undoubtedly happen. So there's nothing more inevitable in life than death because death is certainly going to happen. There's a generation that will be alive when Jesus comes, but that will be the only de generation. There are only two people in the whole known world of, of history or anything that didn't have to fa face death, and one was Enoch. And in Genesis, it said Enoch walked with God and was not. In other words, e old man Enoch He's about a hundred and something years old walking down the road and somebody's watching him and then all of a sudden he was gone. And they said, where'd that old man go? And they said, man, I don't know. He was just walking down the road and then he was, was not. And then Elijah was carried into the, into the heavens in a chariot of fire off of this earth. So Elijah and Enoch, the only two people ever lived on this earth that never faced death, even Jesus faced death. The odds are you're going to face death. The odds are you're not going to be alive when Jesus comes. I know you think you are. And I know looking at the world we're living in now, I think I am. Because I'm thinking, man, it must be close. Boy, things are, such, are turning so quickly and in such a rat race now, I'm thinking surely we have to be at the point of Jesus returning. But I'll just remind you, just as a point of view and a perspective, if you read your scripture, almost everybody in the Bible who had any direct attention with God felt the same way we do. The Apostle Paul, surely, you, I mean, he even says it in his writings that he doesn't think he will see death before the return of Christ. I think it's the Holy Spirit in every generation that makes us feel that way. Because if I feel that way, it should do something in my life, shouldn't it? If I feel like at any moment Jesus might come, that should do something to me, right? It should affect the way I live my life. Because if I, if I say to you, I believe that Jesus Christ could come at any moment and it doesn't affect the way I live, then I either don't believe that or I'm a madman, one or the other. Because I certainly don't want to be doing some of the things that I find myself being tempted to do if I thought Jesus might catch me doing those things when he comes at any moment. No, no. It would purify our lives is what I'm saying to you. It would cause us to want to be more pure in life if we think Jesus could come at any moment. So I think the Holy Spirit gives us that 
inspiration in every generation to give us that, that little lift that we need to, to consider holiness in our life and consider to live righteous in our life that Jesus could come at any moment. And I want to be ready when Jesus comes. I don't want Jesus finding me doing some of the things that I have been so easily beset to do. Right? All right. I don't want Jesus finding me on Facebook. No, I'm just, I know. Y'all think, oh, Facebook's not, oh, I love Facebook. It's so holy. Well, it can be. It's a tool, but uh, it's tough. But anyway, let me get back to the Word. I'm meddling now. Let me put the verses up here, and we'll, we'll scan here, and, and I'll stop where, where I feel like it's time. How about that? It's already 35, so you're already late. Let me just give you a couple. Let me give you just a couple of sentences here, all right? You came all the way out on Sunday morning. You need to have a little word talk to you here a second. James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. He's just talking to the people who he ministers to, and that's all he ministers to are Jewish people that know the Lord and have received Christ in their heart because that's all, that's the, those are the only people at this particular point that are receiving the gospel. The Gentiles have not been brought in. You and I have not been brought in. So he's saying, I'm talking to you. So who is he talking to? Wesley, who is he talking to? There you go. Only Christians. This book is written only to Christians. So don't be thinking that James is talking to your lost friend that lives next door to you. These words are for us. These are for Christian people. He says, my brethren, see, there we go. My brethren, count it all. By the way, have you noticed if you've read James at all, just before James starts putting something heavy on somebody, he always kind of softens it by saying, my brethren, or my dearly beloved. I mean, he'll say that. He'll say, now, it's almost like saying, hey, you know, we have phrases we use today, nowadays, when we say something really hard to somebody, and we realize maybe it, it uh-oh, that came out a little bit too hard, and I don't, uh, and then we say, well, hey, I, I love you, I love you. You know, we say stuff like that, Right. To soften what we just said. Hey, I, I love you, but, but I'm just saying. You know, we do phrases. Well, there's James' phrase. My, my, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And I know the first thing they did is the first thing that many of us do. What? How could you ever count it? You mean I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to be happy <laughs> when bad stuff happens to me? Well, you have to understand what he's saying. He didn't say, you know, be happy for the bad stuff that's happening. Grandpa got ran over by a reindeer coming home from my house Christmas Eve. You know, no, you're not, no, that would be a horrible thing, right? No, we're not happy because Grandpa got run over by a reindeer. But, but, so we're not happy for everything that happens, but we're happy for the things in life that happen that can strengthen us and grow us. So how can, how can I be happy for all that? Count it all joy when you fall, and, and I didn't point this out before because I really hate to be too ticky about stuff. You know, sometimes when somebody's trying to show you some scripture, they'll just take almost every word and they'll say, this means this and this means this and this. And by the time they get through with the sentence, you don't care anymore. You know, it's like, oh, you know, it's just too, too meticulous, too ticky. But just, just, I mean, it's just us here today, all right? It's just, but notice what he says. My brethren, count it all joy. And I've, I've pointed this out. When you fall, not if you fall, so you are going to do it. But when you, and, and here's the word, fall. When you fall. I mean, even by the choice of the word fall, he's expressing something, Right? That, that this is something that comes on you suddenly that's unexpected. How many of you have ever fallen? You've fallen. Help, I've fallen. I can't get up. All right. And, and, and were you able to control your fall? You think sometimes you are, right? You think, okay, I'm going to get this. But what you actually do many times in trying to control the fall, you make the fall worse than it was. You stretch something or hurt something or bend something or break something that if you had just gone ahead and fallen... It, you would have hit the ground and maybe had a bruise or something, but you wouldn't have a twisted knee or a broken lig or you know a pulled ligament or some kind of something that you did in trying to keep yourself from falling. And I'm going to tell you something else: if you ever fall off a ladder, you can forget it. You cannot control your fall. I know you think you can. You, I see you. You get up on those high rungs, you know, and the ones that OSHA says no, don't go above this one. You got two rungs from the top, you know. I've been through all the trainings. Many of you have too, but. You 
you still go up there sometimes because, oh, you just need just a little bit more and you get up. Yeah. And then all of a sudden something rocks and, and you get off balance and you start to fall. And when you start to fall in your crazy mind, you're thinking, I can control this fall. Well, I'm telling you something. Do not think that you can control that fall because you cannot control it. You just better be praying on the way down that you're not going to hit something that's going to break your arm or do something terrible to you like that because don't take the chance. But, but the word fall, I'm, I'm, I'm off on fall. The word fall means that it happens without warning. You just, you, like when you're walking along a pier and you go off the end, you know, I mean, you just, it's just, I, I fall. And what he's trying to do here is give, just help the word picture of the fact that we're all going to have things that happen to us in life that are unexpected. The word various means multi-shaded, so it's multi-shaded like a rainbow, different kinds, different varieties, different types. What would be a trial for me may not be one for Wesley, Wesley for me. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a different, it's, it's one that's designed specifically for me, and God has allowed it to filter through his love and said, all right, this is going to be a good one for Keith, so he's going to be, because he has issues with this, and so we're going to let him just move right through this, and all of a sudden, a, a, a various, a, a different trial is going to come across my path, and it's going to be, according to the word trial, is that word parismos, which means like a pirate, so I'm going to have various pirate ships that show up in my life, just out of the blue. I, I, don't, I don't see them coming. I'm not, I'm not prepared for them. This is not an examination. An examination is when the teacher tells you, here's the material, and tomorrow we're going to have a test on this material. So when you come tomorrow, be ready for the test. That's not a test. That's an examination. A test is what happens to you when you're not prepared. A test is what happens when you walk in and all the maps are pulled down on the wall and everybody sits down and the teacher walks over and gives that little boom, and the map goes and then here on the chalkboard, do they even have chalkboards in classrooms anymore? Here on the chalkboard are the, are the questions. And you get to see whether you've been keeping up with what you needed to be keeping up. Do you know this stuff? Oh, hey, I know you can study and prepare for the examination, but do you know this stuff? That's what a test tells you. And so James says, this is, what, this is what happens in life. We're walking along, minding our own business. Everything's going good. And all of a sudden, here comes an opportunity that has been filtered through a loving God to us to say, this will be a good opportunity for them to get better in life, to be stronger, to be more mature, to be better able, to grow up some. I mean, they need to get out of the nursery class, you know? I mean, they, they need to come on up now. I mean, they're, they're, they're like two years old. They don't need to be crawling around on the floor. They need to learn how to walk a little bit, you know, and, and handle themselves. Here, give them the spoon. Let them try to put something in their mouth. You can't feed them forever. They're going to have to learn how to do this for themselves. And so God says, here's, a here's an opportunity for this to happen. And I'm do -do -do, just walking down. And all of a sudden, boom, man, I fall into a, a pirate attack. I, I just looked, and there were no pirates here. And now there's the skull and crossbones looking me right in the eyes. And I am in the midst of a full-blown issue going on in my life. And James says, when that happens to you, you can say, this is going to be good. Count it all joy. Not that you're happy that you're facing something bad. Who would be, what kind of masochist would you have to be to be happy about something bad going on in life? You know, come on. My husband went in the hospital. He's got to be in there for two weeks. <laughs> I'm so happy about it. What kind of lunatic would you be? The Bible's not telling you to be happy about bad stuff. It's saying that I can be joyful. I can, you know, well, we used to have them. There's one over there on the wall. There's a thermostat right over there. That thermostat has a thermometer in it, and that thermometer goes up and down. You know why? When the temperature goes up, it goes up. When the temperature goes down, it goes down. Well, happiness is like a thermometer. When things are hap, you're happy. When things are bad, 
you're unhappy. It reflects the conditions. But inside that thermostat, there is a, there's a mechanism that you can set over here that says, I want the conditions to be this, and you set it to what you want. Joy is a thermostat. Happiness is a thermometer. So joy in my life is what keeps me okay when everything around me is not okay. Joy is a strength on the inside. Joy is an essence in me. Joy is a filling in my life. Not feeling, but a filling. A Holy Spirit filling in my life where something greater than me strengthens me from the inside so that I can endure what's going on on the outside. What happens when what you planned is not what happens? What happens when the pirates show up? What happens when you fall into a multi-shaded pirate field out here? Count it all joy, James said. James says, let the joy of, of knowing something as good is about to happen change the way you look at this thing. And so he says, my, when you fall into various trials, I'm going to give you one more verse and I'm we're going because I... Yeah. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Notice that he did not say, count it all joy, feeling that everything's going to be all right. He says, count it all joy, knowing. So in order to count it all joy, it's not going to be because I feel something. What I feel is going to be probably typical. What I feel is going to be anger. What I feel is going to be anxiety. I got fired from my job today. All right. You feel anxious about that. How are you going to pay for your house, your car? What's going to happen with your children? I mean, there's no way you're not going to be anxious if you get fired from your job. Unless you already have a better one to go to, guaranteed. Which very few have. So I'm not going to be able to feel good about what just happened to me. I don't, I'm not going to feel good, you know, looking at, looking at, at the skull and crossbones in my eyes. So if I'm going to be able to count it all joy, it, it's going to be because of something I know. I have to know something. And what is it that I know? James says, well, here's what you know, that when your faith gets tested, it's going to produce patience, which we all pray for all the time, right? Which you've learned not to pray for, right? Because the only way your patience gets tested is for something to, negative to happen, right? I mean, if everything goes the way I planned it, just like I planned it, uh, I don't have to have any patience. It happens on my time schedule. It happens just like I thought it was going to happen, and it happens just the way I thought it was going to happen. Okay, great. Life's grand. Hallelujah. You know? For me to have patience, it means stuff has to mess up. It means it doesn't happen the way I thought. It didn't happen in my time frame. Is this ever going to happen? Will I ever be any different? I mean, I have to be stressed. I have to, I have to be bothered. I have to be angry or or anxious, or I have to be upset about things. And then whenever God works me through all that, and I get to see that, hey, it's great to resign as general manager of the universe, and he's going to do it good anyway, then that teaches me something, what do, and it helps me relax. It helps me not blow a gasket when things don't happen my way. It helps me to be more at ease and more at peace. Most of us are suffering from some anxiety issue right now in life. Half of us are taking medicine for it. What is it? Just pure anxiety. It's not happening like I think, like I want on my time schedule, and it's just bumming me. You know, and I mean, anxiety is going straight up your life. James says, I got a cure for that for you. It's called patience. And patience is what happens when stuff happens in your life that challenges you. So if you know this, then you can begin to relax into the healing of this in your life 
and not be so childish and selfish and self-centered and, and anxious in life. And so patience has a perfecting work. But let patience have its perfecting work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Patience is going to ripen your faith. Patience is going to take that green fruit that you have in your life and help it to ripen so that it becomes mature and edible and, and tastes good and is usable in your life. And then you won't be so bummed and frazzled and have a pocket full of Prozac in one pocket and Paxil in the other pocket and some lithium back here and, you know, and a few Darvacets and some, you know, whatever it is you can, you can get out there. They're cracking down on all that, by the way, so some of you better be listening because you're going to need this, all right? But, but so, you don't, so you're not like that, so that you're not held captive to things like that, so that you don't have to have that to survive. You can, be, you can be stable. You can be secure. You can be well. You can be whole. You can be healthy. You know, I, I've talked to people quite a bit all through my life, but, but even in these latter days, I talk to people, you know, you know what people, you know, many, many people that are on drugs and have trouble with well, we, I don't know why we separate alcohol from drugs, but we always talk about drugs and alcohol. Alcohol is a drug. But regardless, that's not the point. The point is, the reason people get on stuff like that is they're trying to make themselves feel better. They're trying to make themselves, they're, they, they're anxious, they're, 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 they're down, they're, they're, their mind's going in a thousand directions and, the, and, the, and they can't have peace and they can't, they can't settle themselves and they can't calm themselves and they can't live life and it's just, life is just bombing and booving and booving and the ADD and ADHD and all these other Ds and everything else and all the letters of the alphabet. And, and, and they have found, they found, they, somebody said, here, here, try this. And, and they found and it, and they found a little bit of it and they got it and they said, ooh, that does, ooh, that does make me feel a little better, you know. Ooh, all right, praise good, good, all right, man, yeah, all right, good. And then, and then tomorrow it's going to take a little more and the next day it's going to take a little more and the next day it's going to take a little more, a little more, a little more, a little more, a little more. So you're drinking a fifth a day and then all of a sudden now you're drinking so much that you anesthetize your, your heart and you anesthetize your brain and they find you laying there dead and they said, what happened? They said, man, he drank himself to death and he did because he had to drink so much to try to give him the same buzz that he started out with, you know, four or five years ago as a little pit me up, hey, I feel better, thank goodness, man. Whew. And he thought that was his friend and he thought it was something that could be manageable, but now it's taken over his life. And now he's laying dead in a ditch somewhere because he's drank so much his heart won't beat anymore. That's what, that's what James is trying to eliminate in our life. That's what James is saying. Look, this is not for us. Here is what God will do. God will work in our life to make us strong enough that we don't have to have that stuff and that we're not deceived by that stuff because he's going to get in and y'all, when we get into him, it'll be interesting. In verse like 14, 15, 16, he says, he says God doesn't tempt anybody, but he says there is real temptation in life and let me tell you how it works and he's going to tell us just exactly how temptation works and what the end result is. It's unbelievable. But... But, but just in the crux of feeling, James, and feeling what God is trying to say to us today, the intent is God wants to make you better. God loves you. God doesn't want you to be weak. God doesn't want you to be susceptible to this. God wants you to have the answers. God wants you to be strong. So that, now listen to this. I'm, I'm, so that, when you walk out there and you encounter darkness, you can be light. When you encounter people and issues and people you love and people you're concerned about and people you work with and people you live around and people that are involved in your life, so that you can become an image of Christ for them. Now, if you think that we're going to get everybody who needs Jesus into a sanctuary like this, then we all have another thing coming. But that's not even what God said to do. He said, you go out there 
and you be me out there and let me do what I do in people's lives out there and we'll change the world. Now see, for 2,000 years, we thought we have a better way. For 2,000 years, you know what we've been doing? We've been trying to bring everybody in here. For 2,000 years, we've been trying to gather them in big crowds and coliseums and stadiums and mega churches and mega buildings. And we have been trying to bring them all in there and let some super professional, pretty, uh, pleasant, wonderful, acceptable somebody say something to them that will help their lives. That's what we need to do. Jesus said, no, no, you are the light of the world. No, you are a city on a hillside. You don't put your light under a bushel basket. You open the basket so everybody can see. That's what he says. Yeah, you, warts and all. Yeah, you, 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 you don't know. I don't know anything. Who said you had to? It's Christ in you that's the work of glory. It's not how much you know about everything. I guarantee you that. And you can be a minister. I had a friend, I'll I'll close with this. I had a friend uh, this week that was so, uh, it was such an insightful little conversation, seriously. A friend that uh, has recently, uh, their life has recently changed for the Lord. And they're involved in somebody else's life that's really kind of on on the edge, a little bit on the edge. And it was such a, it was such a refreshing conversation to hear somebody who was not a professional, not a professional Christian, not a professional minister, talk about what they were doing in this other person's life who needed the Lord. And to hear pure ministry done by a Holy Spirit through somebody who did not have one idea that they were being used. Do you, know, do you know what the gospel is, really? It's one beggar telling another beggar where he found the food. That's all the gospel is. You say, I need to know. No. Well, I would, need, I, I would like, well, yeah, the more you know and things you know, that's good. And, and you come here to be instructed and to be encouraged. I mean, you're in the field house now. I'm telling you what plays we're going to run and how we're going to keep them from sacking our quarterback when we get out there on the field. And you're in the locker room right now, and I'm the coach saying, we can do it, we can win, they can't, they're not better than us. And then we're going to walk out in just a minute, and, the, and there's going to be the game out there. And what the coach wants us all to do is to do, to to practice what we preach, to do what we know, to be salt and light in a corrupt, dark world out there, and tell those other beggars out there where you found the bread. And that's what James is saying to us about these sufferings and these situations in our life. They, they, that is what God uses to prepare us for what we are to do in life. So when you have one of these trials that pop on you, because you know that, you can count it all joy. Thank God. I've got another chance. He's teaching me something else. Man, when I get this, this is going to be a good tool. I mean, you can, your whole attitude about what happens in life changes when you see God shaping you into his image by these issues of life. So anyway, that's kind of what I feel about the heart of James. Maybe that'll help. We'll get the rest of it next week, okay? I know I always say that, but we will in the next week. Next week, Wesley. Wesley, you've got to preach all that next week. Okay. We'll teach you. All right, here we go. All right, stand here.